Good evening. This evening's uh, Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 to 12. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one, then, should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now, about our brother, Apollos. I strongly urge him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. This is the word of the Lord. We are getting near to the end of going through 1 Corinthians, um, and so as has been my practice since being at this church, we will go from 1 Corinthians to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the book of Ruth. Is it Ruth? I think it's Ruth. Esther. 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 Sorry. I get them mixed up sometimes. So we're going to be looking at the book of Esther afterwards. So if you want to do some preparatory, preparatory reading, feel free to do that um, as we go back to the Old Testament. Um, we're also wanting to, once again, as we were doing prior to COVID, uh, COVID has really messed everything up, starting with some discussion evenings, some topical uh, presentations, as well as some... Uh, interviews and some testimonies. So we hope to restart that um, very soon and get back into a more regular routine with that. So once it comes to the questions, we'll give you a bit of advance notice so that you can fire all your difficult questions at us and make us look stupid up front when we try and answer them. So why don't you join with me as we pray this evening. Our Father, we thank you for the way in which you have so generously given yourself to us. And we see your giving of yourself to us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who could have stayed in heaven, but who didn't, and came into this world and was born of a woman, lived amongst us, died at our hands, rose from the dead, Send it on high and has promised to return one day. But while we continue to live in this intervening time between his ascension and his return, we want to ask that you would help us to be faithful in the work to which you have called us according to the gifts which you have bestowed upon us so generously. And as we look to be effective in the work to which you have called us, we pray that this particular passage of Scripture might be helpful for us in giving us some insight into what things are helpful for ministry. And so we ask that you would once again reveal yourself to us through your word, by your spirit, for your glory. Amen. One of the things about ministry in a church, in any ministry, in whatever ministry you're involved in, is the reality that sometimes we plow and we plow and we plow, and we don't always see the kind of results that we would like to see. It's not like when I mow the lawn at home. You mow the lawn, and afterwards it always looks fantastic, and at this particular time only for about five days. And then you've got to remote. But you see immediate results, don't you? 
you can see how the lawn has been changed as a result of that mowing. The problem with ministry is you're engaging in something that is profoundly spiritual. And so, because we are bent towards wanting to see visible results, sometimes when we don't see those visible results immediately, we can become a little bit despondent and frustrated and wondering whether or not we're having any effect or whether the ministry God has called us to is having any effect upon those to whom we are called to minister. And then you have the added pressure, particularly at a church level, but even within these ministries of numbers. One of the things that I was talking to with a fellow pastor on Thursday, I was at the Baptist Union offices doing some interviews for prospective pastors, is the frustration of other pastors coming and saying, so how big is your church? When the reality is ministry is not about numbers. It just isn't. It's about making people grow in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and presenting the bride of Christ as beautiful to Him. And that is done through faithful, hard work, of which the results perhaps one day we will only know in heaven. And so at the end of the previous chapter, Paul has said, your labor is not in vain. And as we look at some of the principles that come out of these verses, I think there's some helpful principles. Hopefully, they will give us a little bit of insight into how we can seek to be faithful in being effective in the steps to fruitful ministry. So let's look firstly at the necessity of planning. Look at verse 5, the necessity of planning. After I go through Macedonia... I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Now, Paul has this particular trip in mind that's been going on for about three years. It's been a number of years since he's visited this church. He wants to get back to them. So after being three years in Ephesus, ministering to the church in Ephesus, and if there's one theological school I would have loved to have been a part of, it's that three years that Paul spent in Ephesus teaching and instructing that church. He's coming to the end of that, and now he's looking to go to the Corinthian church, which tells us, doesn't it, that he is thinking ahead, that ministry is not just about the here and the now. It is about the here and the now, but it's not only about the here and the now. So Paul is trying to have some forward thinking He's trying to think about opportunities that present themselves in the future. And in his own mind, at least he has planned to go to certain places so that he might be of benefit to those churches, and that then comprises of some of the forward planning that he's doing. Romans chapter 15, verses 24 and 28, maybe I should read those to you. I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey. Thereafter, I've enjoyed your company for a while, verse 28. So after I've completed this task and made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. In other words, Paul is a planner. Paul looks to say, uh, what opportunities are there that present them to myself, and I hope and I plan to go to certain places in order that I might carry out ministry. Now, what is true of the Apostle Paul is true of every church, is it not? As we look at the life of the church, as we consider the ministry of the church, we are constantly in the process of reviewing and looking at the ministries we are involved in, asking ourselves the questions, what opportunities exist, what opportunities may present to themselves, how is the community changing? How can we continue to be effective in reaching out to our community? There is the necessity for ongoing planning. And so it might be planning with regard to what we're doing with our Bible care groups. What are we doing about evangelism? How are we reaching out to our community? Are there other ways? How's the evangelism team going? 
And so there is this constant need for us to be thinking about ministry and thinking of ways and praying for ways that we can be effective as we seek for this church to have an ongoing ministry in this community. Secondly, the necessity of flexibility. Look at verse 6. Having said all of that, look at verse 6. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey whenever I go. So here is the Apostle Paul recognizing that whatever plans he puts in place, ultimately those plans are subject to God. And so he plans to go to them, but he recognizes he needs to be flexible because things change, circumstances change, needs change, opportunities change. And there needs to be a willingness to be flexible to make those adjustments, whatever those adjustments are, for ministry to continue to be exercised in a fruitful way. Notice how flexible he is to when he goes and how long he is going to stay with the Corinthian church. He is not so bound by his plans. He's not so fixated on having to do X, Y, and Z that he can't do A, B, and C. And our ministry is like that, is it not? Any of you who have been engaged in ministry know that the best laid plans can come to nothing. That while it's, a, while it's important for us to plan, it's also important for us to recognize those plans may need to be adjusted, may need to be changed, may need to be altered. Acts chapter 16, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says he wanted to go to Bithynia. In his own mind, he planned to go to Bithynia. But listen to what happens. When they came to the border of Marcia, they tried to enter Bithynia... Now, this is remarkable, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So at the end of the day, Paul recognizes he is subject to how God is moving and what God wants him to do and where he should go and how long he should go. Thirdly, allied with this is the necessity of submission, verses 7 and 8. Now, I know we've got to number 3 already, and you think, oh, we nearly finished. Good luck with that. Verses 7 and 8. I do not want to see you now. Uh, sorry, I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. So he submits to God. In other words, God, Paul has a very healthy understanding of the sovereignty of God. John chapter 4, uh, James 4, verse 15 makes the point. That when we say we are going to do X, Y, and Z, we should always add on to that if the Lord so wills. Paul understands that. That it is God's will that becomes fundamental in his planning. And his will and God's will may not always perfectly align. The purposes he has in mind and the purposes God has in mind might not be exactly the same. And therefore, the Apostle Paul always submits to what God wants. God's purposes always prevail. It's always Paul in submission to God, not God in submission to Paul. And it's very easy sometimes for us to want to do what we want to do, to want to accomplish what we want to accomplish, and to press forward with those things when perhaps God is wanting to move us in a different direction. And when our wills and God's wills are in opposition, my question is, who wins? One of the commentators put it like this, and then I want to share a story that hopefully will bring this. God's people ought to know that their time is in God's hands. They should place their lives in submission to God's will. New Testament saints set the example of living in harmony with the Lord's will. So if we think of it at a corporate level, it concerns the will of God for this church. If we think of it at an individual level, how often Do you and I, and I ask the question, fight with God 
about His will and our will in various aspects of our lives. All of his life, David Livingston, that great missionary to Africa, wanted to actually be a missionary to China. Even in his old age, he longed to have the opportunity to go to China and minister. But God sent him to Africa instead, where he worked and died opening up that great continent to mission work, much like Carey had done in India. He never went to the place where he personally wanted to go, but he served willingly, unreservedly, and fruitfully where God put him. He had a great vision for China, but because he wanted, above all else, to do the Lord's will, he was flexible. He was willing clay in the potter's hands to be molded and remolded in whatever ways God pleased him. So let me ask you, are you willing to allow God's will to prevail? Are you willing to put your plans to one side and say to the Lord, if you're taking me to mission works in some obscure place in the world, even though that's not where I want to go, your will be done. Lord, if you're calling me to be a pastor, I never thought I could be a pastor, but if that's where you want me to go, your will be done. Lord, if you're calling me to be involved in this particular ministry, I thought it would be over here, but you're calling me to do this. Your will be done. And then if I can reduce that a little bit personally, when we think about the way in which we live our lives, do we subject every part of our lives to the Lord's will? Those of you who are single, when you end up in a relationship, is it about saying, Lord, is this the right person? Or do you have someone else? Fourthly, the necessity of diligence. Look at verse 8. But I will stay on in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door of effective work has opened for me there, and there are many who oppose me. We're going to come back to that second part of that phrase. Paul recognizes that God still has work left for him in Ephesus, and he must stay in Ephesus a little longer in order to be diligent in the sight of the Lord and to complete the work that God has laid out before him. God has opened that door. God has provided the opportunity. And Paul doesn't want to move on too quickly, lest he not complete the work that God has got for him at that particular place, at that particular point in time. And even though he's going to face opposition, which we'll come to, Paul doesn't allow that to become the catalyst by which he determines to move somewhere else just because life is getting difficult for him at Ephesus. He was a hard worker. He did not shirk his duties. He diligently continued to be faithful in the ministry to which God had called him, where God had called him, for as long as God had called him. And didn't seem to uh, run at the first time, sign of trouble. How easy it is to run when trouble comes. Paul was always diligent. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15.10. This is Paul writing under the inspiration of God's Spirit about himself. But the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. I love that verse because it gives you this incredible balance between striving with all the energy we have to serve the Lord diligently but at the same time recognizing that whatever energy we have is given to us by the grace of God. So at the end of the day, it's not me, but it is God in me and through me by His Spirit who empowers me. Diligent labor is not linked to how much time we spend in a place, but rather linked to the intensity of the effort we make in that place. Jesus had three years. Just think about that for a minute. 
three years in this world. That's not a long time. I've been at this church 14 years. And three years is not a long time. I can tell you as a pastor, it takes you a good six to seven years before you start feeling as though you're finally able to move ahead. And in three years, Jesus changed the world. It doesn't have to be a long time. It has to be a faithful time. Fifthly, the necessity of perseverance. Look at 9b. And there are many who oppose me. Many who oppose me. Here is Paul in Ephesus working with great diligence, but recognizing that opposition is against him. And it's not just a few people who are opposing him. Notice how he frames it. Many oppose me. Now, whenever you are engaged in God's work, you have to understand that you are going to counter opposition. And there are two forms of opposition that you will encounter as you serve the God, God in whatever area you are serving God. The first opposition you are going to encounter is the more easy to deal with, and that is opposition from without. So there are going to be those outside of your ministry who are not Christians, who are unbelievers, who are going to think what you do is strange, and who are going to laugh at you, and some might even seek to oppose you, because they do not have the same things in the mind that you do. Their whole bent is different to yours. Their desires are different. They, they are in the world. They are living according to the principles of the world, and they don't understand why you do what you do, and they may think you're a little bit strange. Now, Paul experienced that in his life. For example, Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. That's pretty radical opposition. To be preaching the word, to be engaging in evangelization, to have people pick up stones and throw them at you, cause you to have great injury that they think as a result of that, that you're dead. Drag you outside and leave you there. So when you live out your Christianity or when you exercise your ministry God has given you or when you simply seek to evangelize the lost, you must understand that there are times when the ministry you are exercising in whatever form it is being exercised, is going to come up against opposition, and you need to persevere. You need to push forward. It's not easy, but God has given you the right kind of grace to do it. But then there's opposition from within, and this seemingly was much more painful to the Apostle Paul. Some of the churches he had founded were saying things about him, like this Corinthian church. So in 1 Corinthians verses four and, uh, uh, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19 of this letter, some of you have become arrogant, says Paul, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only who, how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. So here are a group of people within this Corinthian church to whom Paul is writing that are in absolute opposition to Paul. They don't like him. They don't want him. They want to reject him. They're following other people. And Paul writes to them and says, oh, if I have to come, I'll come and I'll sort you guys out. He's getting opposition from within. That's painful. Now look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10. The same church. Now it's another letter. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. So now there are people in the church saying, you know, Paul is unimpressive. He's useless. He, he doesn't speak very well. And now he's ministering from Ephesus, and he's discovering even within Ephesus, Ephesus there are people that oppose him. And that's painful. It's very painful. But let me encourage you, you are serving God first and foremost, not people. 
And because we serve God, our faithfulness first and foremost is to God. And if we are faithful to God, we will continue to faithfully serve those whom God has called us to serve, regardless of whether or not they accept or oppose the ministry that you are engaged in. So that when you are engaged in rocks or play group or engaged in mission work or whatever it might be, whatever ministry God has called to you, and you've got people within that ministry or within the church who are unhappy about something you're doing or don't like this form of teaching or don't like that particular program that you're exercising or are complaining about X, Y, and Z, you need to remember, persevere, hang in there, keep going. Because you're doing it for the Lord. You're not doing it for people. You're doing it primarily for God. And we persevere for the sake of God. Let me just try and illustrate this with a true story of a missionary who had external opposition. John Payton was at a university student in Scotland. God called him to minister in the New Hebrides. After graduation, he and his bride sailed to the southwest Pacific and began to work amongst the savage cannibals on the island of Tana. His wife and infant son soon died some months later, and Peyton, listen to this, Peyton slept on their graves for several nights to prevent the cannibals from digging up their bodies and eating them. After almost four years of faithful work, he left without seeing a single convert. No converts, four years of ministry. Many years later, his son, by another marriage, resumed the work on Tana and eventually saw the entire island come to Christ. When the elder Peyton revisited the island, the chief of the former cannibals asked the missionary who the great army was that had surrounded his hut every night when he first came among them. Isn't that incredible? God's angels had protected him. Because of his faithful work and that of his son, when he left the New Hebrides for the last time, after ministering on another island as well, it is reported that he said with tearful eyes, and I'm quoting now, I don't know of one native on these islands who has not made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Persevere. Hang in there. Don't give up, whether it's opposition from without or opposition from within. Remember, you are doing God's work, and you keep doing God's work because your accountability is to Him, and you keep doing it in spite of the difficulties that you face. The test of character, the test of spiritual character is not how you respond when things are going well but how you respond when the pressure is ramped up and things are not going well. So can I encourage you ministry leaders who have struggled with these things, hang in there, persevere. Satan can sometimes use the most unlikely of instruments. Remember Job? Remember Job's wife turning to To Job and seeing his pain and suffering, you can understand her words, turning to him and saying, curse God and die. And then Job utters those famous words, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, blessed be his name. Shall we accept good from God and not the bad? He hung in there. He kept going. He kept persevering. And remember when Jesus wanted to go to Jerusalem? Remember what Peter said to Jesus? And Thomas said, no, you can't go to Jerusalem because they knew Jerusalem meant death. 
And this after Peter, when Jesus had said, who do the crowd say I am? And Peter says, you are the Lord, the son of the living God. And blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then the very next sentence, when Jesus says, let's go to Jerusalem, Peter says, no, Lord, we can't go there. And Jesus turns to Peter, and what does he say? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in mind. Now, he's not calling Peter Satan. What he is saying is that as Peter begins to oppose him wanting to go to Jerusalem to fulfill the will of the Father, that Peter is acting as an instrument of Satan. And so he tells him, out of here. So hang in there, my dear friends. I know the struggles some of you have gone through. Keep persevering. Keep pushing on. Let God strengthen you. Let God empower you. Sixthly, the the necessity of teamwork, verses 10 and 11. The necessity of teamwork. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one, then, should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Notice how often Paul works together with others. He is sending Timothy along with the other brothers, that this is a, a team effort. We are all engaged in God's work together. There is no one person more important than the other person in God's work. Paul had a wonderful, sobering understanding of his role in the work of God. God had called him to preach to the Gentiles, and God had called him to take out the message to those who were despised. And as Paul faithfully took that message out, he gathered men around him, and he gathered women around him, and he ministered alongside them, and he got on and did the ministry that God had called him, and there were always people working together side by side with Paul. Ministry is a team effort. If we are going to be effective as a church, my dear friends, we need to engage in the ministry God has called us together as a church. We need to work for the same goal, the same purpose, moving in the same direction. And we need to work for the sake of God's kingdom. Paul makes it clear that they are to treat Timothy well. Timothy is not a less of an equal to Paul. It's not as if you've got Paul here and then Apollos and then Timothy down here. Paul is putting him on the same level because the ground at the cross is level. And though there are obviously different roles with which we are called to fulfill according to the gifts God has given us, it means that all of us, in order for the church to work correctly, all the cogs need to be moving together. Now you and I know that, don't you? Paul's dealt with that in 1 Corinthians 12, hasn't he? Where he looks at the different parts of the body and says... We need all the parts of the body. We don't just need one part of the body. We don't just need preachers. We need everyone. We need people who stand at the door. We need people who engage in helping out in rocks. We need people who are engaged in playgroup. We need people who are willing to clean the church. Everyone needs to be exercising their gifts A church begins to function the way it's meant to function when every single believer within that church is exercising their spiritual gift alongside the others and all working to the same common goal. And then lastly, the necessity of sensitivity. I didn't know how to to frame this last one. I thought the necessity of sensitivity, the necessity of submission, the necessity of mutual submission, you can pick any one of those. But what I want you to see here is the way that Paul exercises such sensitivity towards Apollos in ministry. Look, Look at this. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go with you, with the brothers. So Paul wants him to go back to Corinth. I mean, he's held in high esteem in Corinth. Remember, at the beginning of the letter, some say, we follow Apollos. 
That's his church. Now listen to what he says. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Here is Paul saying to them, I want to send Apollos back to you. I I don't want Paulus to necessarily continue with me here because I think he may be of some benefit to you. This is an incredible, humble Paul, knowing knowing that there's division in the church, that some are saying, you know, we are, we are followers of Apollos, and Paul's not going to allow that to cause division between him and Apollos. Paul's not going to somehow say, well, you know, actually, I'm more important than Apollos. I'm going to keep him here so that you guys d- d- don't end up with too, or he doesn't end up with too great a following if I send him back and you all then get drawn to him again and and this divide is increased. No, Paul is willing to say, I I think Apollos can be beneficial to you, so I'm happy for him to go back. And Apollos then looks at Paul and says, you know, Paul, I'd rather stay here. And perhaps I'd rather stay here because I recognize that if I go back, those divisions might be further increased and I might be used as an example to to others to say, well, you see, Apollos is also engaged in the the divisive work that's going on in the Corinthian church with these different factions that are rising. So Apollos stays and says, no, 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 I'd rather stay. In other words, it is the overall work of the word, ministry of the word, that takes precedence in this situation, and it is the Apostle Paul and, the, and, and, Paul and Apollos who together sit down and have a conversation, a discussion about this, and both determine that the best thing is for him to stay. This is best going to promote God's work. It was important for Paul and Apollos to sacrifice their own desires and their own wants for the greater cause of the gospel. Is that not what we need to do? Sometimes it is our own personal desires that well up within us that create the problems. And we need to always take those personal desires and bring them in subjection to the greater work of the gospel. The gospel sets the agenda. Not our own personal wants and desires. And there needs to be sensitivity to one another. Mutual submission to one another. It's not about me getting my way or you getting your way on those things that are not fundamental to the gospel. It's about being willing to, at times, say, yes, okay, we'll do that, even though I think we should do it differently. So the greater cause of God's work can go forward. So often, it's easy to allow our personal preferences to become the sticking points in ministry. And it's not about personal preferences. Yes, we've got those first order matters, fundamental. Those can't be changed. Those stay in place. Then we've got secondary matters. And I would say we've got tertiary matters. And in those secondary and tertiary matters, there needs to be great sensitivity towards each other so that we don't try and dominate one another. Let me close of how this looks. An incident gives high proof to the natural generosity of the artist Turner. He was one of the hanging committee, as the phrase goes, of the Royal Academy. The walls were full of paintings when Turner's attention was attracted by a picture sent in by an unknown provincial artist by the name of Bird. A good picture, he exclaimed. It must be hung up and exhibited. Impossible, responded the committee of academicians. The management cannot be disturbed. The arrangement, sorry, cannot be disturbed. Quite impossible. A good picture, reiterated Turner. It must be hung up. And finding his colleagues to be as obstinate as himself, he took down one of his own pictures and hung up birds in the place. And this is what the commentator writes. 
If only that same spirit ruled amongst the servants of the Lord Jesus. The desire to honor others and to give others a fair opportunity to rise should, be, should lead well-known leaders to give them place to less eminent men and women. We are not to look to every one of us on our own things, but every one of us also on the things of others. We should be sensitive to one another. And we should not necessarily always put our foot down and insist on certain things that are not non-negotiables and allow for a measure of others' ideas also prevailing, not only ours. Sensitive to one another, willing to promote one another, willing to celebrate the success of one another. Not to become envious and why isn't it me who's enjoying that? Why aren't I gifted like that? Why isn't it my idea that gets adopted? But we should love each other to the extent that we celebrate our diversity in unity as we work together for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And allow that to be the driving force always for how we engage in ministry, both corporately and personally. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. We pray that you would burn it upon our hearts. Only you can do that work. And so we submit ourselves to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he himself takes this word, a living word, and helps it and makes it real to us in our everyday experience. For Jesus' sake, amen.